Well, welcome to another episode of the Addy Hour. You know, as we approach the Thanksgiving season, the holiday season, I'm just grateful to be able to continue to have these conversations because I know these things are really important. The holidays is obviously a time where we try to take time and really enjoy the company of our family and friends, but it can also be a challenging time in a lot of ways. And so I think today, the fact that we're having this conversation about support and advocacy and resources is really uh, timely in that sense. And I'm grateful for the two guests who are joining me today. This is their first time actually interacting, but I already have great chemistry, um, as I noticed off offline before we even jumped in. I anticipate they'll be staying in touch after this as well. So the first guest that I'd like to introduce is Matt Kudish. Matt is the executive director of the National Alliance on Mental Illness in New York City. Um, and NAMI NYC is actually one of the largest affiliates of NAMI in the country, helping support families and individuals affected by mental illness and to also build better lives through education, support, and advocacy. Matt is someone who has been named to city and state's health and power list for the last three years. Um, so he's obviously recognized for his leadership and expertise. He's also the recipient of the Beatrice M. Goldberg Community Award by the West Side Interagency Council for the Aging and also uh, the Emerging Social Work Leadership Award from the National Association of Social Workers in New York City as well. He has a master's in social work from Columbia. He also has a master's in public administration from NYU and is a fellow in the inaugural Strell Fellowship Executive Leadership Program at Hunter College. So someone who obviously is very busy and very skilled in his craft. And we're grateful to welcome Matt to the Addy Hour podcast today. Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure. My second guest that I'd like to introduce is Corey Miner Smith, who is an attorney and the author of Hashtag Driven, also the founder of Corey Empowers and the Driven You community. She's someone who has navigated the mental health care services industry for over 25 years uh, based on her family story, which I know she'll share about likely today as well. But she's also earned a master's in education, guidance, and counseling, and is a trained facilitator for NAMI. So you can see some of the overlap already. So I'm grateful we were able to make this pairing work. And people also know Corey as a thought leader in the social justice space with a primary focus on mental wellness and uh, mental wellness advocacy. As I mentioned in 2019, she released her now highly celebrated debut book, Hashtag Driven, with a forward by renowned motivational speaker, Les Brown. She also has been involved in several different interviews, has appeared on several platforms in the national media space, on talk shows, on the Audible original We've Got Answers, and on radio shows like The Breakfast Club. She's also been recruited by different Fortune 500 companies to actually talk about leadership development and the importance of incorporating strong and relevant mental health care in those conversations. So again, grateful to welcome attorney Corey Miner smith to the Addy Hour. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to join you today. Oh, pleasure having both of you here. Um, and obviously, there's so much important work that you both do uh, in terms of advocacy and just in your day-to-day -day, uh, endeavors. So as my listeners know, I do like to check in and see how people are doing, um, especially with you know some of the heavy topics that you all are engaged in on a daily basis as well. So I wanted to start there and just see how you're doing uh, today of all days and just you know in our ongoing changing societal uh, situation, as it were. So Matt, why don't we go ahead and start with you? Yeah, I appreciate the question too, because I think we don't know what's going on for folks in the midst of these 20 months. And I think I learned early on in the pandemic that I didn't know how I was going to feel each day until my feet hit the floor in the morning when I got up. Uh, so today I'm feeling really excited, energized, and hopeful. Um, and um, also at the same time, balance that with thinking about what these next few months and winter is going to bring, both as it relates to social isolation and, and really being apart again and pandemic surges. Um, but I'm balancing mm -hmm. that, that keeping that in my mind while also at the same time feeling really grateful and, um, and excited. Mm, that's great. And in a sense, um, also just appreciate the way that you talked about that, even in your vocation and in your role, I think it's helpful for people to realize that even those who are serving in organizations who are in the mental health space, doesn't mean that you have all the answers all the times. I mean, as you talked about, just not knowing how you'd feel on a specific day and to give yourself permission to have that unknown in a sense, I think is really important. Yeah. Uh, Corey, what about you? How are you at this at this moment? Well, I say ditto. Uh, Matt covered it all. <laughs> it's very important for us to take the time to think about ourselves when we help people, other people on a daily basis. Sometimes we uh, forget and, or perhaps just don't make ourselves uh, a priority. And it's important to do that. 
Um, and for me right now, just grateful, not just because it's November and we're going into Thanksgiving, but just overall grateful mm. for um, safety and uh, good health, um, battling a little cold, but that's nothing in comparison to other things that are going on right now. And so mm. I'm just grateful and appreciate the opportunity to continue to share um, with social isolation by having Zooms and things that can keep us safe. Um, but just understanding that it's important to still do the work, but we have to make sure that we are keeping ourselves um, energized and healthy in order to continue to do the work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's so well said and so important. I appreciate you know the way that you all are bringing just these, I mean, the perspectives, the gratefulness, kind of the reality of the unknown. I think that that's, it's just healthy for us to be able yeah. to have, you know, even these types of conversation um, as leaders to say, okay, there are things we can look back and be grateful for, but there are also things that we know are still challenging, even as we have that attitude of gratefulness moving forward. So definitely appreciate the standard and the example that you all are living to. And I know that doesn't mean it's easy. Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. But you know that going in. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, the pandemic really kind of shined a light on um, how easy it is to forget how difficult that it can be. You know, I consider myself to be a pretty resilient individual and the struggle has been real and really up and down despite feeling incredibly grateful and fortunate. I've had my health. I have not had COVID-19. I'm lucky enough to be in a, in a, in a safe house and mm -hmm. have access to everything that I need. And this pandemic really forced me to kind of dig deeper and say, well, if I'm struggling mm -hmm. and I see myself as pretty resilient, what must this be like for everyone. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of times we hear people talk about uh, that we're all in the same boat uh, going through this. Um, and I think we're all experiencing coronavirus at the same time, mm -hmm. but our boats look really different. And mm -hmm. that, you know, some of us are on a, a, a super yacht. Some of us are on a, a raft that's falling apart. Some mm -hmm. of us are by ourselves in a kayak. Some mm -hmm. of us are with friends on a speedboat. I mean, you know, it really, uh, we're all on the, riding the Corona River, as it mm -hmm. were, mm -hmm. um, but but the journey is is very different. And I'm so grateful for that perspective because mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't see it really in that mm -hmm. same way prior to all this mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. yes. I think that's saying a lot. I appreciate that honesty as well, because even in your you know position as someone who thinks about these topics often, even things that you're also learning and seeing as we're going through the pandemic um, as well. Uh, Corey, I wonder if in your work, you know, as you've been involved in advocacy as well, have you seen any shifts as we've kind of hit the pandemic as well and tried to think about mental health? Obviously, there's been more attention, as Matt mentioned, to the mental yes. health piece, but any shifts that you've noticed? Yes, surely an increase in need. Mm. And that's why I'm very grateful for organizations like NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, that have transitioned with our world transitioning and having these opportunities for virtual um, classes, virtual seminars, virtual trainings, because mental illness or mental health conditions do not stop because everything else in our world has stopped. Mm -hmm. And people need these services um, and their medication and their uh, support systems, the ACT team, anyone has the ACT team, uh, assertive community treatment teams that come out and help this pandemic doesn't stop those needs. And I'm really grateful for organizations that found a way to continue to keep their employees safe mm. and provide the services to individuals that need it. And that is those that's for those who already were established with the services. What mm. we see now are people trying to deal with, you know, grappling with their feelings and emotions and losing a job or losing family members. And they don't know how to deal with their emotions and how they're feeling. And may not know about any of these organizations and using them for the first time, like food banks, but being grateful that these things are here and mm. maybe they don't want to have to use them, but they know it's there and they can use them without shame. Mm. So I think it's very important that as we see, see this increase, we know there was already a need. And then that helps us as advocates to continue to advocate for more services, more right. funding, more treatment, because it doesn't stop. If anything, it's going to increase. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're exactly right. And I love how you pointed, you know, paying that as kind of two different foci in a sense, really pointing people to the resources that are there, but also making sure more resources are available mm -hmm. in that way as well. Um, and that's a good, that's a helpful segue as well. Cause Matt, I was going to have you just actually talk a little bit about, you know, how you got into this work and what actual services NAMI provides for any who 
may not be familiar, only vaguely familiar with some of the uh, some of the work that you all do. Yeah. So I've been with NAMI New York City for a little over four years. And prior to that, uh, I worked with older adults and their caregivers uh, with a focus on Alzheimer's disease and other neurocognitive disorders. So I worked in aging for about 15 years. And then the opportunity came to move to NAMI NYC. And, and people would say, oh, why, you know, you've been doing working in aging for so long. Why are you doing this 180 and going into this whole other space? And it really isn't a 180. There's so much more in common um, with Alzheimer's, especially, um, uh, it's not a mental illness, but the stigma is, is profound. Mm -hmm. The shame that it brings to families is, is, is just as powerful. The ability for the person who is living with the illness to participate and play an active role in their wellness, their recovery, their well-being is, is meaningfully um, impacted by each of these and the impact on families and caregivers and communities more generally uh, is really similar. Uh, and so what I found at NAMI NYC that's so special is that we are a peer organization. So the mental health space is a really crowded space mm -hmm. um, and organizations like ours that are focused on individuals with lived experience, both mm -hmm. people living with mental health issues and family members, mm -hmm. friends and other supporters um, coming together to share their personal experiences, their journeys, the validation that they can share from understanding what you're going through because they are living it as well. It's outside the treatment uh, modality. So, but it also complements what we do. This peer support model is complementary to every one of those more traditional treatment kinds of intervention. So you can go to therapy once a week. You can be served by an ACT team. You can be in um, a, a clubhouse program and still come to NAMI NYC, get support, get connected, find community and a sense of uh, a sense of belonging, which can be really difficult. I think so often when people are struggling with mental health issues, they and their family members feel so isolated and alone. And we're here, we've lived it. We are living it. And when you walk through our door or you pop into one of our, our virtual sessions, mm -hmm. you're, you're welcomed and you see that the playing field is level, uh, that there's really a, a, a safety and a non-judgmental approach to the work we do. For us, things really start with our helpline. Mm -hmm. It's uh, available Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. It's the primary way that folks first connect with us. I like to say you don't need to know what questions to ask. Mm -hmm. Just call. And our helpline responders can help you figure out what's going on and the best way to kind of navigate your situation. I think we have to remember that if you've met one person who's living with or affected by mental illness, you've met one person. These are not easy um, uh, situations to solve with a one size fits all approach. It's very individualized and person centered. Uh, and so we like to start where people are and connect them both internally to our full array of programs and services, all of which are available free of charge, and also connect them to very specific, meaningful resources that may exist outside of our wall. So we keep a really robust resource directory of over 500 entries of programs and services and resources within the New York City area for different community members, for diverse communities, for different kinds of needs, whether it's legal assistance or housing mm -hmm. uh, or any other employment, anything that you can think of really intersecting with us. We want to be a, a trusted resource of people mm -hmm. who understand and get it because, because of that that uh, lived experience. Yeah. And from the helpline, it really kicks off to evidence-based education classes. We have over 30 support groups that take place every single month. We do a lot of stigma reduction work. We go into mm -hmm. schools and community centers and companies, uh, and we do a ton of advocacy. Mm -hmm. And we're recruiting folks to be to lend their voices to these issues and these causes to help shine a light on how many of us are affected. We say one out of five of us is living with mental illness. Well, the other four are their family members, their friends, mm -hmm. their colleagues at work, their social networks, their next door neighbors. So these issues really affect all of us. And when we find a way to talk about what we're going through, we realize we're not alone. We realize we are part of a community mm -hmm. that is deeply impacted in these ways that other people can really understand, appreciate, and validate. That's so good. I mean, such an array of, of just opportunities. And I love the framing too that, it sounds like in a lot of ways, it's an entry point. The fact that you're saying people don't need to know what to ask, I think is powerful because I think sometimes that can be a hesitation, not knowing what to ask, even if it's, you know, someone that you know who's struggling or someone, you know, you may be struggling yourself and not knowing where to start, but to be able to have that 
level of openness to try and figure out what to ask in the first place and to be able to be plugged into all the different resources and programs that you all have and you connect other people with too. I think that's really powerful and we definitely need more of it. Yeah. And I think being treatment adjacent and Mm -hmm. and having as wide a front door as we can with as few barriers as Mm -hmm. possible Mm -hmm. and really being of the communities that we're Mm -hmm. connecting and serving allows us to create a space where you don't have to know the answers. You don't have to to, you just, we just want you to call. We just want you mm-hmm. to come. Just connect with us to recognize um, that this is a journey. Mm-hmm. These are marathons, not sprints. Yeah. Um, and and anything we can do to provide that kind of support. I think sometimes we live in a world today where there's it's a little dangerous to make mistakes in some mm-hmm. ways, to say the wrong thing or to use the wrong word. Um, and we want to create a space where people can can feel vulnerable and safe exploring these issues Mm -hmm. to figure it out because they're so complex and there's so much nuance and it's so individualized that I don't want anybody to feel the shame that they can't sort of discover what's going on, discover on this journey of how to help someone, how to help yourself while you're helping someone. Um, So we really try to just be as open as we possibly can. Yeah. And I really love that. I mean, the way that you're inviting people in, because it's it's tough already. So that, that piece is, is huge to be, have that, to be able to have that openness and invitation to really include so many folks in so many ways. Yes. Corey, to pivot to you, I know you've also been involved in NAMI, but then also have a bit of your own story that you've been walking through even before you know, you got involved in the organization. So I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about, you know, your path into this work and the ongoing work that you're doing as well. Yeah, I heard you say walking through and I I feel like I was thrown into this Mm. space, you know, like, and I had to figure it out uh, like a fish out of water Mm. flapping around because I was around 14 years old um, when we had to take my mother to the emergency room. Uh, She was talking nonstop, incoherent, She had the ideas of grandiose, uh, thinking that she had miraculous powers and all of these things. Mm -hmm. And so for me to hear that, I did not know what was going on. And for me to not be able to uh, interact with her because it was I'm talking to her, but she wasn't talking to me. And it was like I wasn't there. Um, But a family member came and we went to the emergency room. And that's when I heard the diagnosis for the first time. Uh, manic depression, paranoid schizophrenia, and manic depression now known as bipolar disorder. Um, But still, those were just words. Mm -hmm. Didn't know what that meant. Didn't know that that would ultimately mean that she wouldn't be the mother that I thought that I had or would have for the rest of uh, my life. Um, But it was a learning experience. And so from that age of 14, um, basically seeing my mother go in and out of mental health institutions. And by the time I went to college, I just was trying to learn all that I could. And my first education piece, if you would, is a television movie called Out of Darkness uh, that starred Diana Ross. It came out in 1994. But when I saw the previews, I'm like, it looked very, very familiar. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to watch this. Like, But I didn't know that that was mental illness. I didn't know that that was some kind of a way related to my mother's diagnosis. But Mm -hmm. as I continue to educate myself uh, and then getting a master's degree, that wasn't because I wanted it necessarily. I wanted to learn more about mental illness and Mm -hmm. what my mom was going through and studying from the DSM-4 at that time, the five is out now, Mm -hmm. but that helped tremendously in in learning a bit more and what could happen and uh, what was available for my mom's future Mm -hmm. as well as mine. So with that, Um, Once I started my career as a lawyer, my aunt, my mother's sister, who was very instrumental in helping my mother as well, she uh, saw an article uh, for NAMI in the newspaper. She clipped it out and put it in my mailbox and she had a little note on it saying, I think this is something you should uh, go to. Mm. And it was the family to family uh, course. It was 12 weeks at that time, back in 2009. And I went to it. Um, I think I was probably the youngest person there, the only person there who was there because of a parent with severe mental illness. But all of our stories were so similar, so similar. And we learned a lot from each other as well as the course. And then as I continued in my career, and most of uh, my last 10 years of my career was in public housing, and we provide housing for individuals with disabilities and low-income families and seniors. So dealing with reasonable accommodations and other things that are on the legal side, 
was giving me a whole nother aspect of advocacy for individuals who are living with severe mental illness. Ultimately, you know, I started helping to raise money for our local NAMI chapter uh, through the walks that we would have. And I then wanted to get trained um, and give back. It was my way, you know, someone took time out to provide these free services for me and my family and other families. And I wanted to be able to do the same. So I did do the training. I uh, co-facilitated my first course and I also participated for the first time um, and speaking to law enforcement as a part of their in-service uh, training and sharing our lived experience and helping them to um, have st strategies in place, procedures in place for helping someone in crisis and things that they can do in working with the family. So I think that's so important, especially in the Black community. And we have concerns of calling the police. We want help, but you don't know if anybody is going to make it alive and those are realities uh, for us, unfortunately. And I know I've had to call the police a number of times on my mother. And today, looking back on it, I feel fear. But I'm grateful to God that nothing ever happened uh, to my mother and that we had law enforcement officers and, you know, individuals from community treatment teams that helped, um, even when they didn't have to help. You know, we I kind of feel like I had an informal a uh, network of people because they knew me or and knew they had my number, they could call me mm -hmm. and I could call them to try ultimately to keep my mother safe, even when her behaviors weren't so safe towards me. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's so important. I mean, there's so many just key pieces that you just, just talked about. I mean, from the, the legal aspect, from what you've gone through as a, you know, as a family member um, to just having that support and having teams in place. Uh, I think it's so um, encouraging to hear the way that you have walked it out in a sense. And I know walking isn't, you know, not the best way to put it, because as you mentioned, you were thrown into it. But the fact that you've been able to take that throwing in and turn it into a journey that's really empowering so many people, I think is really, really uh, uh, amazing in a lot of ways. And I, I know, you know, having heard you talk elsewhere before that you definitely are a proponent of the team approach and how important that has been yes. as well. And I think that's a theme that cuts through the work that both of you do in terms of that, these aren't things that are done in isolation. And in a lot of ways you're trying to get folks out of that isolation to make sure that there are ways to really um, approach this um, as teams. Uh, but I'm also curious because both of you are so involved in the work itself. Do you think that permeates? So, I mean, as we were talking about before we came on, you know, and Matt, you mentioned as well, one in five who are uh, dealing with mental illness and the other four probably know someone who is. But then I feel like there's also a difference between those who are actively in the midst of it and have all of these components that you've talked about and think about these things deeply versus some who are in the midst of it at the moment and may have perspectives on the outside. Um, so when we talk about how mental health is viewed as society, do you feel like there's a difference between those who are kind of in the midst versus the general portrayal in society? And if so, are we making progress in actually improving that and making those two a little bit more aligned? Um, so I know that's a big question, but yeah, who want, who I mean, wants to, uh, from what I ahead. hear and from what you're saying, mm -hmm. I really feel like those, any, any of us, those who are in the work or not, we're part of the one in five. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're a part because that's any mental illness, you know, mm -hmm. depression and that any anything that causes and I'm not a clinician, I'm a lawyer, <laughs> but anything that causes heightened emotional um, something, you know, like it could be good stress or bad stress. Right. You know, planning a wedding that can be great, mm -hmm. but it's also stressful. But it's a good stress. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, having a death or um, uh, having issues at work that could be like bad stress. But depending on how it impacts you, it can be from mild to severe, right? It just would like depression. So, you know, you're not eating well, you're not sleeping well, whatever your symptoms may be. And I feel like that is one, the one in five. But severe mental illness, one in 25 experience severe mental illness. And that's uh, the biggest distinctions that I can, um, that I have, that I recognize. And mm -hmm. Uh, are the hallucinations, delusions, mm. and anonagnosia, where the person doesn't even have knowledge that they're sick. Mm. And that can be very, very dangerous. It's very, very difficult because you try to communicate with your loved one. You see the behaviors. They don't see the behaviors. And it can just be very, very complicated. 
But the biggest distinction for me for any mental, mental illness versus severe mental illness when you're dealing with the hallucinations and the delusions in anonagnosia, any other thing that's impacting you mentally are things that we can perhaps have outside treatment for. We may not necessarily need medication or we may need to invoke more self-care and you'll be able to deal with it. But self-care alone is not going to deal with severe mental illness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I just caution people as caregivers because the statistics are alarming for caregivers and their own health declining Mm -hmm. because of the stress and strain Mm -hmm. of helping a whole nother person in that Mm -hmm. person's life, in addition to your own life, work, children, family, whatever your responsibilities are, and that of another person and their hallucinations or delusions if you're dealing with severe mental illness. Mm -hmm. But even with depression, if if maybe in its most severe forms, Mm -hmm. you know, causes a lot of stress Mm -hmm. and strain on the caregiver as well. So with that, I encourage people in whatever work that they're doing, Mm -hmm. that they implement what is good for them in terms of self-care. That's not just going to the spa and things of that nature, Mm -hmm. but meditation. And sometimes it's just chilling, like just chill Mm -hmm. out. Yeah, Take a seat somewhere and chill out. Mm -hmm. That's really well said. Do you have other specific tools that you've encouraged folks to use or even things that you've used yourself um, over the years? Yes, like walking, sitting by water. Uh, You can listen. There's so many apps that are available now too, like Mm -hmm. Calm, Mm -hmm. um, Headspace, different things like that. But what I found, and even counseling, is because of my busyness, Mm -hmm. I needed to calm that down and Mm -hmm. be consistent. You know, uh, for example, what can I now, it took me three times to go to counseling and for me to commit to it. Once when I was a child, unfortunately, my mother um, did attack me and I was removed from the home. And so a part of the court order was for me to um, go to counseling. I didn't like it. I might've went to two or three sessions. I share this because it's, it's okay. Mm-hmm. If your first time isn't, doesn't work out, you know, just try it again. Maybe that counselor and you don't jail. That's fine. You don't you don't have to go to just one. Mm -hmm. Um, Another time was when I was in law school and I may have had like mild depression then based on the survey. Right. But all of my responsibility at that time would be you would think that, you know, you probably are stressed out Mm -hmm. and causing some level of depression. I was a new mother. My son was potty training when I started law school, Mm -hmm. new wife commuting to law school and law school in general is just hard, Mm -hmm. you know. So I did try it, but maybe one session, I did not like it. But the third time I'm still with her today, it's been about at least 10 years, but what made it effective was when I made the commitment to be consistent with my appointments because of everything else I was doing, counseling would be the first thing I would cancel. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn to not operate out of a crisis, not to try to get an appointment when I'm overwhelmed with whatever I was dealing with in my life but just having it as a constant on my schedule, not canceling it and going. Yeah. That's so important. All those things that you brought out just in terms of doesn't always work on the first time, like you said, (laughs) having that persistence and willingness to kind of make it a priority too, which is also not easy. And you're right. I mean, people don't always gel. So I think to your point, people shouldn't be disappointed if it doesn't work out the first time. Right. There's room, there's no, you know, there, and people have to be in the right, it has to be the right combination. Um, just even in terms of personality and all the different types of styles that different therapists use. So just being open to saying, okay, that style, that person might not have been the right fit. That doesn't mean we throw it all out. Right. Per se. So your example, I think is great. I think it's like dating a little mm-hmm. bit. Yeah. Yeah. Where yeah, it's, it about, it's about that it fit. It's mm-hmm. about that fit. And not everybody is going to be what you need in, in that moment. And I also think that, you know, when you think about therapy, it tends to be a white middle upper class sort of construct that Mm. that other people from other cultures and other diverse groups aren't used to going to a stranger and talking about what's going on inside of them that they've maybe never said out loud before to Mm. someone else so not only do we have to help normalize that it's okay to talk with people who are expert and trained to help guide you through it Mm -hmm. uh, which is hard to convince people you know oh we don't talk about that stuff outside the family or that we got this this is our our problem to solve. Thanks anyway. But then you have to get people to realize that it might not work on that first try. Mm -hmm. Um, And how important it is to find someone 
who understands your experience so that when you're talking about what's going on for you, they may not, they don't have to have literally experienced it themselves, but if they're, if they don't understand the culture, the context of where you're coming from, it's going to be a lot harder to really feel like you're seen and heard in a way. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to have to explain You're like, I'm a gay man. I don't want to have to explain what that means to Mm -hmm. my, my straight therapist or right. It just, it's it's a different starting point. And I think it's so important. But if we think, I, I know a lot of people said, oh, I tried it once. Not for me, mm-hmm. therapy. Not for me. You got to try it again. I think it's really important. Like Corey said, it may not be that first shot for whatever yeah. reason. Maybe mm-hmm. it's not the person. Maybe you're not ready for it. But you got to you gotta keep, keep giving it a shot if you can, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. So well said. And I really appreciate that, you know, in your role too, that you're thinking about, you know, that cultural competency, like you talked about, so that people can can engage with you all on that too, and know that if that's missing, that's a huge component that can really be, that's important and needs to be part of it. So the fact that you, you all are, are making that plain and making it known, I think is really important as well. Yeah. Matt, I was well, going to ask, these, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say these differences matter. They really make, it, yeah. it matters a lot. Yeah. Um, after George Floyd was murdered, we started a group called Black Minds Matter Mm. to create a space for people who identify as Black and living with a mental health condition to come together among those multiple levels of shared experience. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, you know, we heard from a lot of people early on, I've been waiting for Mm. this kind of space to be here. It's unfortunate for us, it took the murder of of George Floyd to, for that to happen. but since last summer, it's really been a, a consistent, ongoing source of, mm. of support where the people who attend that group feel seen. Mm. They feel their experience, you know, when you talk about what you're going through and people are nodding along because they get it, you feel you feel that. You feel mm. validated and seen and normalized. Um, and it's similar to what Corey said about being the only one in family to family who was there for a parent, dealing with a parent. You can, there's a lot of relatability around having an ill relative, but it's different when it's your, your parent than it is if it's your spouse or your adult child. Those relationships matter. It's the, it's the same thing. The, all of those sort of data points, mm-hmm. we really want to make sure that there's connectivity among them so that people are getting the most out of the experience of support um, and giving it too, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it goes in both directions when you're in a group or a class. It's you're sharing and you're right. being shared with. And the power of that is um, really ex- exponentially, I think, increased mm-hmm. when you you relate to the people around you, when you feel seen mm-hmm. and you feel um, that, that shared experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. And I think it's, it goes a long way in building that level of trust too. It's really important in moving forward in a lot of ways through, through the challenges because they are challenging. And if the trust isn't there. I think it makes it that much harder for people to really engage. And, and Corey, it sounds like you all had that in the group too, just the, the relatability. Then it seems like there was some right. level of trust that came with that as well, because, oh, these are other people who can relate to what I've been through and we right. can trust each other to learn from each other about how to navigate it, which I think is really important. And what I also found important um, just in the community, because some people don't want to identify with Mm. how they know you Mm -hmm. (laughs) in the community. um, But once I guess whether it's like an eye contact or it's okay, you know, I want to give you a hug (laughs) uh, because we know each other from NAMI. Uh You want to make sure that you are respecting people's um, privacy and, Mm -hmm. and what they are willing to share outside of, of the space. Um, That's important as well, but. Yep. It's great to still have connections with people who went through the program. Yeah, that's great to hear those continue as well. And Matt, that's One other, Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say something that goes back to the your question, Dr. Mm-hmm. Addy, yeah. around kind of the state of, of mm-hmm. things now. And, um, and Corey, as you were talking um, about the distinction between mental illness and serious mental illness and... Um, one of the things that I've, we've been talking a lot about is how it, this is, these issues that are not they're, they're not binary. It's not all or nothing. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's far more spectrum mm-hmm. than it is, um, you know, a, 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 a binary, an all or nothing kind of, of, mm-hmm. of thinking. So you can have optimal um, mental health and still have experienced symptoms of mental health challenges. You can be um, living with a diagnosis of serious mental illness and have 
really great, positive, strong mental mental health. So the plot points on that, on that, those quadrants, mm. really, I think help people see that if you have a brain, you have mental health. Okay. And your mental health is going to be impacted in whatever goes on throughout your day mm. in positive ways, as Corey was saying, and in not so positive ways. Mm. And I think everybody being forced to kind of live through this, mm -hmm. I hope, and it feels as if there's a little bit of a groundswell toward recognition that it isn't us and them, mm -hmm. that we're all on that spectrum. We're all mm -hmm. within that continuum of that, that, that framework. Um, and how it doesn't take much to negatively impact your mental health, wherever you are at baseline, whether it's living with serious mental illness or not. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that that has positively impacted the space mm -hmm. through by people understanding how um, universal it really is yeah right it is i mean because it doesn't discriminate mental and i love that you use the brain <laughs> uh, just saying because i just said this in a speech somewhere like anybody that has a brain has mental health right and then it's the condition of it so i think about legal forms that we have to fill out especially with divorces right and one of the questions is about your health what would you put poor good excellent that's essentially what the surveys are. And depending on what your numbers are, that could tell you whether you're mild to severe in depression or whatever it could be, right? And I would love it if we could just have this um, more openness. And it really does attribute to stigma. Mm -hmm. Stigma, it seems like as soon as you say the word mental, we on pause, what are you going to say next? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not connecting with that word. Mm -hmm. What are you going to say? <laughs> but we have to understand People are so open to blurting out what their physical conditions are, mm -hmm. the physical ailments and whatnot, but not so much with the mental. And so I say, okay, just take mental and physical out of it. I'm having some health complications. Mm -hmm. Do we need to know us with your mind or with some other part of your body? No, that's between you and your doctor. But what I am encouraging people, uh, the words of uh, B.B. Moore Campbell, she was a three-time New York Times bestselling author. I claim her as my favorite author, but she was a tremendous advocate for NAMI in California and started uh, a, a chapter in Los Angeles where she lived because she was leaving her community to go to a predominantly white area to get the services from NAMI. So uh, she's now deceased. But at the same time, she would say, you need to get a checkup from the neck up. Right. We go get our physicals. Hopefully everybody goes once a year. Why just stop here? Like go up as well. You can ask your doc doctor for a mental health survey or inventory or whatever they may call it. And you can do that for your children as well. I was very, very pleased with the pediatrician's office here uh, when my son was younger. They're both adults now. And happy International Men's Day, I must say. Uh, <laughs> I've you. never heard of that before. I, heard I that actually today. didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to send both of my sons a text and just say it, you know, just to say hi. <laughs> <laughs> that works. That works. But at any rate, um, you they have them available for children as well. We can't mm -hmm. say, oh, they're too young. It, no, we have to be proactive. Don't operate out of crisis. Don't wait until it gets mm -hmm. to, you know, these behaviors being, okay, now something has to be addressed here. You don't have to get to that point. Be proactive. When you go for your physicals, ask for a mental health uh, inventory as well. It doesn't mean that you have concerns, but if it identifies something, why not treat it? Why not find out what you can do to help yourself versus waiting till it gets to a, a bad, bad place, which mm -hmm. it could. Yeah. Yeah, definitely agree. Well, as a neuroscientist who studies the brain, I agree with both of you. And I'm actually <laughs> impressed that you both brought that up before I did. <laughs> but I, th I mean, it's critical. I mean, to be honest, I think as neuroscientists, that's something we need to do a lot better of in terms of educating the public and saying, well, there are things that are going wrong in your brain that's going to have consequences. I mean, we think about that when we think about strokes mm -hmm. generally in society. We don't think about that when we think about things like depression mm -hmm. or anxiety, because there are so many components that can lead to those things. But we tend to forget that that happens through the brain. Like these experience that, experiences that we have impact our brains which impacts how we approach these situations. Um, so, I mean, you're both, you're both experts in my mind already, but yeah, that's something I've shared with audiences as well too. Like if I, you know, just based on the things we study, if I go and I increase the levels of certain brain chemicals in a certain way, 
more than likely that can push you into one direction or another and lead to depression early time. So in the same way, I mean, I always give the funny example, you know, if someone broke their arm, they wouldn't just leave it and say, oh, I'm just going to kind of, you know, get some counseling for my arm or pray over my arm and then maybe it'll get better. You go to the doctor, you get a cast. But we do that with our brains all the time, irrespective of what type of experience may have caused that change in the brain to occur. But we sometimes just leave it and don't actually address it. So I love that checkup from the neck up and all, all those components. Well, and I think it doesn't it's, our brain it's control our whole body, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to have it in optimum shape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think it is so connected to stigma. I think people yes. don't think about it as part of the brain or what because they don't want to deal with it. They don't want it to be happening to them. It isn't real. It isn't true if I just pretend to ignore it. And we know that that doesn't work. We know that that's not, that's not the case. And I think when we think about stigma, so often we think about creating a space where people feel comfortable coming out about what they're going through. Mm -hmm. And I think we also really need to create a sense of inquiry where mm -hmm. we are actually feeling empowered um, to say to someone who may seem like things are not going so well, mm -hmm. to say, hey, are you okay? I'm worried mm -hmm. about you. It's not enough to say, well, we just have to create a world where people feel comfortable coming forward and talking about it. If you're living with serious mental health issues, you may not have the ability mm -hmm. to talk about it, to come yeah. out and talk about it. It's on the rest of us, those other four, to 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 find a way to say, I'm worried about you. Are you OK? How can I help? Um, I think that's so important if we're going to really move the needle on this and, and kind of pull the curtain back. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think another layer on that, too, is just the, the fear that comes with that, too. And maybe that's also fear of the unknown, because when it comes to the stigma, obviously, but then also our brains, I think sometimes there's a fear of, well, what is that going to entail? And medication can be effective, but medication isn't the only way we change our brains. So, I mean, even things like meditation change our brains. Being in community changes our brains. I mean, I think at this point in time, a lot of us have a better feel for that. Being in isolation, something felt different. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the effects that community has on our brains and how it engages certain reward pathways in our brains that help us feel better and go through our daily rhythms. I mean, there's even studies looking at, you know, the power of prayer and how that can impact the brain and counseling can impact the brain, medication. So, we have to have an approach where we take all of these different factors. And obviously I'm biased and focusing on the brain, but as Corey mentioned, the brain does control our bodies. So it's legitimate bias, <laughs> but just, you know, think about all these different components and ways that can actually impact our brains and how we interact with each other and not being afraid to engage in those. So I think, you know, in a lot of ways, as I'm talking out loud, there's probably more that we all should be doing in partnerships with this, with yes. the advocacy work, with the neuroscience to really bring these types of conversations to the forefront so people have a better understanding and even try to move past the stigma in that sense as well. So just to give a story, I had given a talk years back um, at the public library that I called the neuroscience of addiction, just to kind of get a sense and help people understand what happens when you have exposure to certain substances for periods of time. And so people from the community came to that. There were also a bunch of folks from a recovery house that came to that as well. And so that turned into a really nice dialogue. It wasn't just me there kind of giving didactic information, but I was sharing what we knew about the brain, they were also sharing from their experience. So in a sense, we both learned from each other. So a lot of the folks, you know, some of the folks walked in and said, oh, well, I don't really see this as an illness because I did this to myself, mm -hmm. which at some level is true. You can't become addicted if you've never used a substance in the first place. But by the end of the session, they said, okay, well, now I have a better understanding of what my use has actually done to my brain and how the brain I have now is not the same as it was before. So it also gave them a sense of ownership of ways to move forward to get to a new normal without being stuck in a what, you know, this is an illness and there's not much I can do about. So I, I mean, I feel like that was a really useful conversation for both of us to be able to both sides to be able to get to a better place of understanding. And also me as a scientist, not just talking about those things and not thinking about how people are experiencing some of the things they're going through, whether it's with the medication or medication mm -hmm. uh, assisted treatments and all those types of things. So. Because I'm saying we need to have more more of what we're doing right here, and it, it can really go a long way. Yeah, and nutrition as well. We mm -hmm. often leave that out, but the mm -hmm. things we eat and drink, just whatever we consume, impacts our brain health and mm -hmm. overall physical health as well. So we can make a lot of changes just by um, being aware of what mm -hmm. we are putting into our mouths. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's so true. <laughs> And it's so empowering, too, to recognize that there are things over which I actually have some control. Mm -hmm. This isn't happening to me um, in every way. I can control 
my response to this. And I think, what you know, we do, we have a group called Hearing Voices for voice hearers, mm-hmm. people who hear voices. And some of them are on medication. Some of them are in counseling and treatment. Some are doing both. And some have said, I don't want to take medication. Mm-hmm. I want to, I can tolerate the voices. It's manageable. Mm-hmm. It's not having a negative impact on my life right now. And I'm okay with this. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's a level of autonomy um, that people actually can have an agency and power in how they're going to approach this. There's not, again, it's not that one size fits all right. approach to getting well, to, to doing better. You have to pay attention to what's going on for you mm-hmm. and really figure out what those, to the extent you can figure out what those pieces are that are, are your holistic approach to treatment, even mm-hmm. through the lens of self-care. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like self-care sometimes can feel so prescribed, like it's mm-hmm. meditating, yoga, or running. Well, if you don't do any of those three three things, do you beat yourself up for not doing it? And then you're in this negative cycle as opposed to self-care, you're doing self-harm. So like Corey was saying, I try to, we try to think about self-care as what do you need right now to be okay? Mm-hmm. And maybe it is just sitting by the water and maybe it is yoga, meditation or running. Maybe it's just crying or looking out the window at the leaves falling off of the tree. So it's, <clears throat> excuse me. We can we can play a part in in moving that needle mm-hmm. and where we are by using the resources, the tools, the supports that we have to create that that kind of wellness approach for ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Definitely agree. Definitely well said. And I love the examples too of just meeting people where they are. It's, you know, mm-hmm. even as you're talking about, some can tolerate the voices, some don't want the voices. And just saying, well, what it goes back to the point Corey is making as well. I think Matt, you're also making like what do you need to actually navigate the situation? And that's a topic that came up with the last guest as well, Sean Aston, talking about his mom, Patty Duke, and some of the challenges with the language that was used in terms of suffering versus navigating. And the mm-hmm. fact that we can navigate through these things and still be at a place of having overall health and, and um, not gratitude, wellness. but kind of, yeah, wellness mm-hmm. in our lives, even if there are some struggles that are going on in the background. And so, I mean, Matt, you talked about the spectrum. Corey, you talked about the spectrum. Even if someone has a serious mental health challenge, but is navigating it in a way that's still effective, we can't ignore that. And we can't put that in a box of, oh, this is still bad. Or someone who's on there, you know, we have to really just have a broader perspective on these things and help people navigate and thrive in a lot of ways. And we don't hear those stories enough. Mm. We hear so many stories of people living with mental illness who are not doing well, or people who are committing crimes or doing like wildly inappropriate, awful things who we assume are living Mm. with mental illness. Mm. But we don't really hear stories of people living with serious mental illness who are are doing all right. They're Mm. doing well. There's so many ideas, so many misconceptions around what who lives with mental illness and what it means if you do. Mm. And I think to normalize the the reality of it, that recovery is real, Mm. that you can live a rich, full life with a diagnosis of mental illness, serious mental illness. we need to tell more of those stories about people who who are are living well and not focusing on sort of the negative or assumed mm-hmm. um, attributes of who's yeah. living with mental illness. Yeah, that's really well said. And those assumptions can lead to all sorts of, you know, often those aren't even correct. And the ones that are the minority of the cases get blown up and get the exactly focus and, and the uh, the attention. So I think it's really and just important. perpetuate the misunderstanding. Yeah. And and that that uh contributes to the stigma and that right. keeps people who are living with these issues in the right. shadows. So it's just this negative cycle. Yeah. I mean, especially like with the violence that you talked about, because the pervasive thought is that people with mental illness are more likely to commit those types of crimes, which is completely non-factual and false because they're much more likely to be victims than to be the ones. But if you talk to people in the general public, that is not the current understanding of things, even though it's completely incorrect. No, not at all. And I think, um, even further to that point, mm-hmm. um, we're assuming that some, like clearly someone who's committing and this kind, those kinds of acts of violence are not doing well. There's something going on for them. But to just sort of label them as mentally ill is such a uh, gross injustice. It's mm-hmm. not fair. It's not fair to them. It's not. It just um, shines the wrong light on on what these issues are and mm-hmm. who's living with them. Yeah. So as we wrap up, I think we're also, you know, touching on the many things that we still have to do as a society. So I'm curious, you know, from both of you, obviously 
the work that you're doing is so important is making a huge impact. But what do you see as the next steps that we need to make either within your organizations and your initiatives or as a society in general? Not a small question. <laughs> yeah, it's not a small question and there is not a small answer, but like a, we need an overhaul to the mental health uh, system. It's, it's too difficult to get help. And I feel for those families that don't have help or don't know where to go for help, which I'm trying to use my voice as much as possible, but also housing. Housing is one of the first things that a person loses dealing with severe mental illness, uh, as an example, because of the behaviors and they may be interpreted as um, violating lease terms, for example. But having housing available, quality housing, I've seen some deplorable conditions in group homes and things of that nature, but they still get the full dollar for an individual staying there. So some of the things that I want to work on is just helping with um, legislation that can help uh, increase the quality of life for those living with severe mental il mental illness, as well as quality housing being available with the understanding of, you know, behaviors and how they can just have the opportunity to live in, in quality. Mm -hmm. I can't stress that enough. Quality mm -hmm. housing, mm -hmm. um, you know, with property owners that understand the behaviors that may be exhibited at any given time. Yeah, so well said. At NAMI NYC, uh, we're really focused on reaching underserved communities right now. Uh, and we're defining that in, in pretty broad ways. So black and brown communities, of course, also deaf and hard of hearing communities, the LGBTQ communities, older mm -hmm. adults, non-native English speakers. We really want to make sure that the programs and services that we're offering, not only do all individuals understand what they are, that they're free and how easy it is to access, but that they, again, they feel seen when they show up, when mm -hmm. they come, they dip their toe in, in the NAMI NYC water, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're also focusing on the family piece, the family caregiver piece. Uh, we're, we're continuing to provide programs for people who are living with mental illness, and we always will. But one of the things we recognize is we're really the only resource for family members, especially family members of adults. Um, and so we want to make sure that uh, families know that there's knowledge and skill and support that you can learn from our 40 year history that can make a meaningful difference, not only in your life and in the life of the individual who you care so much about, but in your shared life. You know, so often we're winging it. And when we're winging it, there's a tremendous amount of tension and friction that tears families apart, but it can be better. It can be when we know what to say, what not to say, when to say it, when not to say it, how to say it, <coughs> excuse me to separate the person from, from their diagnosis and their mm -hmm. symptoms and see them separately so that I can hate bipolar disorder, but I love mm -hmm. this person. Mm -hmm. uh, we're really focusing on those, on those family pieces as well. And then as Corey mentioned, advocacy. You know, we can have all the programs and services in the world, but if we don't improve the mental health system, and for us specific, we're working on five tenets, but the one I'll call out today is decriminalizing mental illness. Um, it's so critically important for us to really move the system, to change the mental health system so that it really can be mental health for all. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't an easy, easy question, but I definitely appreciate both of the answers that you both mentioned. And I encourage listeners too, to just uh, reach out to your local NAMI as well, if there are things, resources you're looking for or ways to get involved and to support. And Corey, even as you mentioned with the housing, any specific suggestions, Corey, for listeners in terms of ways that they may be able to get involved in some of these fights from a legal perspective? Yes, contacting their uh, local representatives, state representatives, as well as their federal um, legislators and finding out NAMI is very good. It has an advocacy um, piece on their website where they can let you, it tells you about pending legislation and how to communicate with your um, Congress member. And it's just important for us to know that these things are important. The mm -hmm. emails, the phone call, they are important. So we may not think we're making a big impact because it's just one phone call from us, right. but you can get your family and friends to do it as well. And if there's ever a hearing that you can uh, go and sit mm -hmm. in and even be able to speak, I suggest you please let people know that you are willing to, to do that and share how important some of these pieces of um, legislation are, especially with the... Uh, Exclusion. I, I'm sure you can give me. The, is it the IMD exclusion? 
for the bids. There's like a limit on the number of bids that mm-hmm. are available mm-hmm. yeah. in order for a refund to occur to that local entity. Mm-hmm. It's a it's just unfortunate that it's all about money when you have real lives that are being impacted and need the services. Um, so I just encourage individuals to go to organizations, websites like NAMI, like Mental Health America, like the Treatment Advocacy Center, and look at their legislation and policy and procedure uh, piece because they they have so many things already in place, templates you can use to help you to be able to communicate with legislators who can make a difference. And the time is now to make mm-hmm. that difference. Mm-hmm. That's great advice. Well, thanks so much to both of you for the time, taking the time out to join the ADR for sharing all these wealth of resources with our listeners and sharing your experiences and your advocacy as well. Definitely appreciate your time and the work that you all do. And I think we'll have to follow up and continue this conversation at some point. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I do want to share also with your listeners Mm -hmm. that they can go to CoreyEmpowers.com. I put together a my go-to mental health guide. Mm -hmm. And again, me just coming in raw with this and (laughs) just wanted to learn all I can, but it has movies and books, blogs, apps, just different things that you can go to at your leisure to find out more. You know, mm-hmm. if it's someone you're dating, someone you're married to or a family member or your child or yourself and you mm-hmm. want to know more, please look into it. Don't just try to ignore things because more than likely it's not going to go away. Find out what you can do now. Find out more about treatments that are available and resources that are available as well. So that's at CoreyEmpowers.com, my go-to mental health guide. Really important. I'm I'm so grateful you've put that together. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. It's great to be here. It's such a pleasure to get to know you, Corey, and hear about all the amazing things you're working on. Yes, it's a pleasure to meet you as well, Matt. And I look forward to staying in touch with you. Likewise. Excellent. Thanks to both of you again. 